think a lot about sex. Probably <laughs> more than the average guy. But probably also not quite in the same way as the average guy. Because my daily research involves work on syphilis, a sexually transmitted disease caused <laughs> by a spiral-shaped bacterium like this one here. And it's a nasty disease, actually. It starts as a local lesion in your private parts, and this lesion may spontaneously heal, disappear, and if you're unlucky, the bacteria disseminate throughout the rest of your body, leading to rashes, unspecific symptoms such as patchy hair loss, fevers, muscle aches, fatigue. And if that progresses further, it can go into your brain and your heart, causing blindness, paralysis, insanity, even death. And it's one of the few bacterial infections that actually goes from pregnant women to unborn babies. So yeah, it's a nasty bacterium, this one. And you might think, hey, but this is something that belongs to the Middle Ages, to the Renaissance, right? But it's not. It's present today, here. Not just in the developing world, but in developed nations, in Western countries. In rich places, in Europe. So let us play a game. Let's play who wants to be a syphilis expert. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> Which of these countries do you think had the highest number of new cases of syphilis per capita in 2010? I'll give you the options. A, Portugal, B, Switzerland, C, Germany, D, the Czech Republic. And now, let's play it. So how many of you, raise your hands, would go for Portugal, A? Not many people at all, okay. What about B, Switzerland? Wow, all right. C, Germany? Quite a bit as well. Maybe there's many Germans and Swiss in the audience. <laughs> D, the Czech Republic? All right, I'll give you the answer. It's Switzerland, otherwise associated with cheese, chocolates, Swiss army knives, great punctuality, great organization, great healthcare system. Weird, right? Here's the data. You can see that the number of new confirmed cases per 100,000 individuals in 2010 was higher in Switzerland than in the other three countries. And yes, of course, it's hard to compare the data because the systems work differently. The numbers that get into the databases might not be necessarily representative. And what I can tell you is that the number for Switzerland is an underestimate. Reports are at least twice as many. In fact, one doctor in Zurich has already seen 75 infections this year. And these infections are associated with large cities, with sexual networks, larger sexual networks, and with other sexually transmitted diseases, like HIV, for instance. But this is puzzling, right? I mean, we're in Western countries with great access to healthcare, and in fact, this disease is treatable. We have antibiotics. One shot of penicillin works, and you're cured. So why are we seeing this reemergence in Western countries? And this was something that puzzled a professor of the University of Zurich a couple of years back, Professor Humayun Bagheri. So he and I met for coffee, and this was around the time that I had just finished my PhD on orangutan genetics. And I had been using my genetic toolbox to disentangle the relationships among orangs. Who are the moms, who are the dads, who are the offspring, how similar or different are the populations? And he said, Humayun, the professor, Natasha, why don't you use this genetic toolbox and try to disentangle the relationships among the different bacterial types that cause syphilis in Switzerland? Let us see if there's something special happening here. Or maybe it's the same as in other countries. So I moved from working on these wonderful furry mammals to working on these <laughs> corkscrew-shaped bacteria that literally screw their way into your host cells. <laughs> Makes for great party conversations. <laughs> <laughs> but I am gripped by the topic, because our project has crossed national boundaries, and we've gone on to work with amazing medical doctors and researchers from all over the world. And in this journey, there's so much I want to share with you, but there's one thing that has become clear to me, that old diseases, just like old habits, die hard. 
and to understand why something old but treatable is still around, we have to look at three main questions. One is, what are the origins of the disease? In this case, syphilis. When and where did it enter human populations? Did it get transmitted from animals to humans in spillover events like with HIV or Ebola or avian influenza? Or has it been present for a really long time? Two, we need to examine the spread. What behaviors, what human behaviors, influence the transmission of the pathogen? And third, what about the cure? Is our cure enough? Does it work? Is it effective? Will it be all right? So let's look at the first question, the origin. Well, we know very little about syphilis until the 1500s. Much wasn't spoken about it. And then there was this war in Naples in 1494, where you had lots of people from different countries who went there, soldiers, and when they went back to their own countries in this movement, in this international movement, they took back syphilis with them. And very quickly, people realized, OK, this is a sexually transmitted disease. Being sexually transmitted meant it's associated with shame, with sinfulness. So quickly it started being blamed. Blamed on the poor, on the depraved, on the foreigners. Because you see, syphilis was not called syphilis back then. It had many different names, depending on who you blamed. So the Germans and the Italians blamed it on the French, calling it the French box. <laughs> the French <laughs> blamed it on the Italians, calling it the Neapolitan disease. But the Germans were blamed by the Poles, and the Poles were blamed by the Russians, and the Netherlands, Great Britain, and Portugal blamed it on the Spaniards. <laughs> and of course, these flags were not there back then, but you get the picture. With the name of a disease, you get an excellent portrait of the international relations of the day. <laughs> Soon after, people started wondering, well, hey, maybe Columbus brought it from South America. Maybe it was brought from over there. And this is a question that scientists have been working on for a really long time, which, unfortunately, despite all the hard work, remains unresolved. I can tell you a few things that we know, though. We know that this bacterium, Treponema pallidum pallidum, that causes syphilis, is part of a big family of spiral-shaped bacteria, which you see in this cartoon tree. This phylogenetic tree depicts relationships among the bacteria, and branches that are closer together are meant to represent things that are more similar. So the bacterium that causes syphilis is part of a group of other bacteria that cause similar diseases, like yaws and bedgel, and it's also closely related to bacteria that cause Lyme disease, Borrelia. We know that these bacteria originate from free-living organisms. So they did not come from spillover events in recent times. But we also know, as I mentioned, that they have been in human populations for quite a long time, at least for the last 500 years. And people had to live with it. They had to die with this disease because they didn't have antibiotics for a really long time. In fact, this bacterium and other sexually transmitted bacteria and viruses have found themselves a fantastic way of transmitting themselves, right? What other behavior can you think of is as widespread as sexual reproduction? Because if you and I are here today, it's through sexual reproduction. And the sad thing is that being sexually transmitted through skin-to-skin -skin contact is also associated with a degree of shame. There's a certain stigma about it, right? So if you have a itch, if you have an itch in your private parts, it's not something you really care to share with other people, sometimes not even with a doctor. So voila, we have this bacterium lurking in human populations, persevering, getting transmitted, and it's, un it's not really surprising that because it's been around for so long, it's not just us that transmitted the pathogen and influenced the pathogen, but the pathogen influenced our behavior, like fashion. This is Henry VIII, and you see the fashion of the days. And what he is wearing, if you gaze down at that bulky item, you see the codpiece. <laughs> and that codpiece may have been, according to some, a disguise for the medical treatments of the day, which involved using bandages and salves to cover the sores of your private parts. So what better way to disguise it than to turn it into a fashion statement? Here are chocolates. These are not plain Swiss chocolates. 
These are medicinal chocolates. Because as I mentioned to you, when there were no antibiotics, people had to use other treatments, and mercury was one of them. And the French, of course, <laughs> allowed the production of chocolates with mercury in them. So that husbands could give these chocolates to their wives, treat their wives and themselves without having to reveal that they had acquired syphilis through their adventures. <laughs> But we are lucky today. I don't have to accept or worry about accepting chocolates any longer. <laughs> We've got something else, right? We have antibiotics. And since 1943, people have successfully used penicillin to treat syphilis. Since 1943, we've brought the levels down of syphilis. People don't have to die because of it. Mothers don't have to transmit it to unborn babies. But it's re-emerging in Western nations. It's coming back. And what I'm going to show you is a little teaser of the results we've had so far in our genetics work. So again, I'm going to show you a phylogenetic tree. And the orange little fruits that you see on the branches are the samples that we've collected from different countries in 2012 and 2013. And the yellow ones are from other times in the 20th century. And what we are seeing is that many of the samples, the recent ones, are extremely similar to each other. As if there was this wave of a bacterial type sweeping through these Western nations. So yes, maybe there is a particular type that is more virulent, or maybe one that we're less immune to. But it's not just something related to the pathogen. It's also something about our own behavior. And this is something that we can change, because we've seen this in the past. Often, too many times, we've seen all diseases come, take center stage, make us scared, pose a threat, lead to devastating consequences until we develop the treatments to target them. And then, when they're no longer such a big threat, we ignore them, we forget about them, we stop worrying about them. But they still may be there. Just think about tuberculosis. Still there, increasing in some places. What about other sexually transmitted infections, like gonorrhea? Still there, increasing in many places. And many of these are increasing in numbers, but also in terms of antibiotic resistance. If we forget about things, if we ignore them, that's when things get dangerous. And that's what we can change. What you can do today, when you go home, is to remain vigilant, to start thinking about it, to think that perhaps safe sex is not just contraception, because we're talking about the pathogen that gets transmitted skin to skin. Remain vigilant, educate to recognize the early symptoms and get treated. Remove the stigma attached to an itch in your private parts. You can also go home and turn the lights on. And I don't mean in the bedroom, I mean intellectually. What we need to do is to start thinking more about sex the way that I do. Thank you.